Oops, Sabre fans. Uh, Jimmy here. I'm going to be walking you through today three hilts of the same character, of similar design. The Darth Maul Rebels slash Rogue One lightsaber. <clears throat> I am one of those very few, few people that has, have got all three versions that have been made to date. Um, <laughs> I don't really do reviews of other people's work, but uh, since I have all three, it would be kind of a shame not to. Um, so, we'll go in release date order. Uh, we have the Denis Lukyanov, sorry if I butchered your name, Gen 1 Crimson Lord, We've got the Corbanf Crimson Menace, then the Denis Crimson Lord Gen 2 of which I've designed chassis for all three, um, but I'll just go through, break them down a little bit and show you what's going on. Hopefully point out some uh, differences between them if you are curious. I know uh, there isn't many left for sale now. I think Calic Hail Sabres, Sabre Armoury, sorry, has got a few left in stock. I believe Shane is all out of stock on his. I may be wrong. Either way, check out both sites. Uh, anyway, right, let's uh, clear these two off. So it wasn't that long after I discovered the more professional, <laughs> personal side of custom sabers um, that I then went ahead and bought this bad boy from Justin when he was running the Saber Bay. Um, of course I live in the UK so it came in and obviously it wasn't a cheap hilt it came in and it cost me an absolute fortune at customs uh, originally it was at KR Sabres that I first saw it and I was really debating getting it at the time and I, was, I really kicked myself when I decided not to and then decided I really wanted it but Justin had them in stock so I bought one from the Sabre Bay, this is the Gen 1 um, and when I got it I, I fell in love with it, this was absolutely fantastic, I really wanted this hilt, it's a nice staff, um, not too chunky, and of course it was the first of its kind. Obviously there are like the LGT sabers and stuff like that, but uh, I don't really count those. Uh, this was the best version at that time, possibly the only version that was released. Um, and so <clears throat> it came in a battered box with some foam padding. I don't think it was the original, the original box that it was meant to come in or anything like that. Um, but Dennis's design is awesome. It comes in this really nice tumbled finish on the, the uh, aluminium, uh, which gives it a nice, like, semi-weathered look out of the box. Like, it, it would look best if you actually did weather it. Um, the Gen One, these red bars here are completely static. You cannot use them as actuators but you have the silver panels both sides which are sprung loaded in two different positions that you can use as plungers to actuate switches on the inside. Uh, this is a yeah, this is a one inch blade either end. Uh, the blade retention screw is underneath here, you thread off the emitter. No, I'm getting confused. <laughs> getting confused between all three variants. Right. So this one here, the blade retention screw is right here. Unscrew that. And then if the blade plug that comes with the hilt doesn't fall out, just unscrew it. So take that off. So it's a nice big thread on there. So it's, you'll never worry about this locking up. So that's nice and easy. Blade plug isn't going anywhere. Uh, then you have the claws. Um, you can't. The way it's done. I'm not sure if you can hear that. Especially if I've got music going over this as well. It's a little bit of wobble. Nothing dramatic. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's a nitpick or anything at all. Um, if you really complain about that, then you've got um, issues. If that's your biggest problem in the world right now. <laughs> 
uh, but it's overall very solid, like in the hand. But unless you're actually trying to force it, it's not wobbling. Um, and we've got these little holes here, which are to hold on your shroud, this shroud here. So you just put, drop an Allen, Allen key down there, uh, tighten them in, and then you'll release this shroud. And then down here, this is a big hilt, so I'm going to be bashing it all over the place during this review. Uh, down here you've got a red banded emitter. I don't know the history of it. I haven't actually looked into it myself. I feel like Dennis's versions, especially the Gen 2, is probably the best it's ever going to get. Um, I could look to try and do my own, but I don't really think I'd be adding a lot to the community if I did. So the red band has a tiny little hole in it, which you use to then try and find your blade retention screw, which is underneath. I had a feeling it was around here somewhere, but I can't be wrong. Oh, is that it? I think that's it. Right. Put the iron key in, turn it. It's a snug fit, so it doesn't immediately drop out. There you go, you can see it there. Right, so whilst we've got that apart, we can go over the chassis I designed for it. This is a chassis bespokely for the Gen 1 Crimson Lord by Dennis. Um, I've installed mine with two Golden Harvest 3.3s. This isn't the first chassis I've ever designed for. I've actually, one of my earliest chassis designs, not the one I was really known for, but I was one of the first people to come out with a chassis for it, for the Gen 1. My first chassis for it was originally comprised, because I only had a tiny little 3D printer at the time. I had a middle section, an end section, and an end section here, and it was held together by magnets. Obviously, the printer's gotten bigger, the printer's gotten cheaper, and if you know what I do now, I can't stand magnets if I can help it. I, don't, I think they're acceptable for chassis, but not for the whole construction of the chassis, for like little bits and bobs, but I don't think they're acceptable for hilts whatsoever, especially for plungers, they should poor design work. Um, so, and that's a good thing about these hilts, these actuators are spring loaded and don't drop out, there's no magnets on this hilt, it's very well designed, it's a really robust hilt um, and I do love it a lot. Uh, and so I redesigned the chassis for this hilt um, not too long ago, just before I started working with Shane and it takes two team. <laughs> Two 18650 batteries, one per board. Got two crystal chambers here. Got a speaker here and a speaker here. And what it's doing is projecting the sound in, then back out. Uh, the sound venting. The only this is the biggest nitpick of this hill. The sound venting wasn't very good. Um, it was hidden, and it was maybe this hidden a little bit too well. Uh, but, saying that, uh, whenever I've installed it and got the chest in there, it wasn't like incredibly quiet. I think some people over exaggerated the issue, but I know Dennis addressed people's concerns in the Gen 2, and the Gen 2 is a lot louder. Um, but overall, I think it's a fantastic hilt, really robust, really solid. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm really sorry, God. I'm just, I'm just red, I've got some quartz crystals in there in each chamber and I'm trying to remember, I'm not going to light up a laser or anything like that, it so slides in nice and easy like that and then you've got obviously the, the emitter here, threads down, clamps it all together and then hopefully you can see that, that's lit up nicely. much in the Golden Harvest V3 configurations here. Uh, Sound menu balance. So 
I can hear it. I don't know. Probably you guys can too. I haven't got this idea, that's it. But yeah, I can hear it. Pretty cool. So, yeah, it was one of my first custom sabers, this one. It wasn't that long into the game that I actually bought it. And so that's pretty good. Got a nice robust hilt. Feels really good in hand. It's not too fat, not too thin either. Very, very solid. Cool. So, we'll take those back out. So the reason why I designed two batteries for two boards, four switches, two crystals, two speakers, two stock emitters, PCBs, short pins. Uh, I was told that you never ever run two boards off of one battery, um, of which it makes sense to me. Uh, but I like to have both size completely independent of each other anyway. It's slightly more expensive to do any chassis that way, but um, for the sake of my, the advice from somebody who does know what they're talking about, um, two boards off of one battery isn't advisable, as I was told. But I'm not the expert. But here it works out for me the way I want it to anyway. Cool, so that's the Gen 1 gone over. And then the next one released was the Corbanth Crimson Menace, of uh, which I have got multiple chassis designs for this one. Um, this is a bit of a trickier hilt. It's not as accurate. It is slimmer. It is easier to hold. I will give it that. It hasn't got the nice tumbled finish on the aluminium, like Dennis's versions have. Uh, the emitters, as to that orientation, you kind of get what you get. You can't control where this is actually going to align the slot, or this one either. Um, the fact that the whole emitter here is held together by three countersink, very shallow, very small grub screws, um, not grub screws, countersink screws isn't fantastic but saying that it only takes yeah it only takes a 7 8 inch blade so it's not exactly like you're swinging a lot of weight around on it because you can't exactly get a heavy a heavy dueling blade for it so it help, it holds itself very well um, the claws are more robust in position than the gen 1 this one has a little bit of wobble to it um, it's a great clean hilt, it really is. Um, I do like it, I do like the attempt, it's just not in my books as good as Dennis's versions. And so, work from our top down. To access the blade retention screw, you unscrew your emitter and then you've got a blade, hidden blade retention screw here. <coughs> Excuse me. Nice deep blade position there. Got your claws, as I say before, they're in a nice solid position. Um, there is a very visible screw here, but uh, I, I'm, not I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a person that's worried about that kind of thing, um, especially if. Uh, it just means that the hilt holds itself together better. I try and avoid it on my designs if I can help it, but it is what it is. I'm not bothered by it. Got some nice big sound venting right here. I hope you can see that and it's not being faded out. Yeah, you can see that. Very obvious. Obviously it's going to be very loud. You can't not hear it. <laughs> um, they didn't attempt to hide anything. Uh, you've got a screw here that holds your shroud on. This is a big no-no for me. This screw was way too small for something that's going to be on the outside and you know people are going ripping onto and it's going to be wiggling around. The screw was too small and now the shroud just wobbles around and then your allen key that goes in there, you've got to pick the right size allen key. 
go in there. The nuclear is so small. Like it, you know, it. That'll hold it for a bit. Hold it, see, a little bit, of, and then it comes loose again. You got your screws holding in your panels for your switches, your plungers. Great thing about this. That's an actuator. That's an actuator. That's its own actuator. That's its own actuator. So the red panels are actually useful. Um, and then uh, they're obviously very easy to access everything and check alignment if you design your own chassis as well because you can take these out with these, um, though the screws are visible. Plus and minus. And then you come down to the bottom emitter. Gain access to the play potential screw. You unscrew your emitter and it's hidden right here. While we're here, we'll unthread this. And then we can slide out my chassis. Now this is the latest chassis I designed for it. Which is capable of being printed in one piece. This long piece here is capable of being printed in one piece on an end of three. And then you've got a fixed part of the chassis up here, which threads together, holds itself in place. Um, and again, I've installed this with Golden Harvest V3s. There is a crystal chamber version available on Shapeways by my by myself. Um, I opted to change out purely because I had originally printed my chassis, crystal chamber chassis for this in resin. And after a while, it just snapped and broke. Um, I wasn't using very good resin. Uh, it was right when I got a resin printer as well, I maybe it was a little bit over eager. Um, obviously I know a lot more now, but equally FDM prints, this is super clean. So I stayed with the FDM print for this. Again, it takes two 18650 batteries, two Golden Harvest, Golden Harvest V3 boards, uh, four tactile switches, two speakers, stock, Miss her PCBs either end, and then some more PCBs up here. Uh, high amp kill switches. Die on! There we go. Um, so, uh, let's put this in. Now I've got an alignment system, JSJ alignment system, system here. I can't remember which way it goes, but I will soon find out. It slides in nice and easy. It's a certain point. Yeah, and it self aligns itself. So, the good thing about this chassis system is if you get it in wrong, you won't be able to get the mess back on. But if you get the chassis in sort of semi correctly, it will line itself as you travel it down. Now, I'm trying to remember how I configured this. Okay, so the top buttons are your on and offs, and then these must be the auxes. Loud. Um, I have got the speakers kind of directly facing the sound vents, but I have got the volume turned down as well. Because the Golden Harvest V3 can really kick out some sound, especially through the 22mm Veco speakers. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, my least favourite out of the three, but it's still a good solid contender. Um, though this is Corbanth, it was sold by Corbanth and it has a callback box box on it. I believe it, it was LDM savers. I believe, don't quote me. Um, I don't think they were working with ELF savers at the time. I use 3,500 milliamp batteries so they're a smidge longer than usual. This one's only a 3,000 so it comes out a lot easier. Brand new battery. Voila. Right, and then finally, we have the Dennis Gen 2. Now I know when people were complaining about Je Dennis Gen 1, um, not having good sound venting, 
there was a rumour, or he made a post that he was doing some sleeves for the Gen 1, I don't know anything about that. I don't know if that came to fruition or not, um, but the Gen 2 is louder, more solid, better finish, overall a fantastic hill. Dennis really really did a great job on this one. Uh, so let's go over it from top to bottom. Our emitter, you want to gain access no, so your blade retention screws right here. Small grub screw in the dead centre, which is cool, it's fine, it's not a big grub it's not a big screw, it's not got a head on it, it's not super obvious. Um, I'm trying to remember how this is all goes together. Okay, yeah, so good thing about this is the emitter is automatically aligned with the rest of the hilt as you assemble because of how these screws here attach it. Um, to give the best screen accuracy. Comes with a really cool blade plug. Hopefully this one slips out. There we go. So it's actually an aluminium shield with a brass insert there. Um, which, so if you're putting this on display, it looks accurate. Dennis paid a lot of attention to it. Obviously when you take it out and you put a blade down there, I believe it's a one inch blade. This is a fat blade, I haven't sanded it down at all, so. But it is a one inch blade that goes down there. Um, quite deep, reasonably deep. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, obviously you miss the aluminium bit when you put the blade down there, but equally, if you were to make this as is right now, one solid bit of aluminium, having machining that as it is currently right here in that shape out of one piece, uh, would be far more expensive and far more difficult to do, whereas having it like that, far easier to make. Put that back down. Uh, claws, more robust than the Gen 1, still a little bit of wiggle, but I mean it's tiny. You, you Honestly, it's only because I'm moving it up and down that I can feel it. That's all it is. If I swing it around, I can't feel any wobble out of course. So if you're forcing it, you're going to be able to move it. If you're not forcing it, you're not going to feel anything. Um, as we go down, this is your sound vent around here, around the inside of here. Very nice. Uh, you can't see it, very well hidden. Come to your plungers. Now the red ones are static again on this one, but you have the same similar system as last time. You've got two springs and two plungers on each of these silver panels to act activate your switches. Um, and then these black panels here are held down with magnets. Now this isn't a problem because they're down, they're recessed, they're not loose. Uh, they all they kind of fit quite well into the shield here. So this magnet solution is not a problem. This is actually when magnets should be used and this is how, how they're used correctly. Uh, and yeah, so not a problem. And once it's in, it's in. It's not a plunger that you hold, hold in by a magnet. That's a stupid design. Um, this is a great panel right here. Used with magnets in the most ideal situation. And then you come down here. You've got another sound vent around here, all the way around the collar, which is nice. And you come down here and you've got uh, some visible screws around here. Now, I may be wrong in saying this. I'm sure Dennis or somebody can reach out and just tell me. These might be accurate as to the prop that Ray Park was holding in uh, Rogue One. I don't know. I'm not bothered by it. Looks cool. And you've got your emitter here. And I believe one of these screws is your blade retention screw. So you can see how deep that is as well. You've got a nice deep blade depth. And again, yes, yeah, one inch. Big stubby blade that hasn't been sanded down at all. Right. And another cool feature about this end is this is a self-orientating end. So you can turn this collar independently to try and control how this 
orientated once the threads are done up all the way. And so we get to the chassis. Unscrew it down all the way and you gain access to my chassis. Which again I've installed with Golden Harvest V3 boards. Um, very similar looking to my Gen 1 chassis as you can see. Uh, centre part can be printed in one piece and you've got two crystal chambers at the emitters. Crystal here, crystal here, stock, V3 emitter pin, the short pin emitters each end as well with two speakers pointing in the direction that they should be pointing in, not sideways, but pointing outwards following following the path of the sound being vented outwards right next to it. So it's nice and loud. It is a very nice and loud saver. Uh, so let's put some batteries in here. Again, 18650. Two batteries, two boards, four switches, uh, four high amp kill switches, two crystals, two speakers. Uh, as you can hear, it's the same sound font again. This is by Jesse at Hyperphonic. Go check him out. Right now, I can't remember which one. No, nope, these are the power ones. You can just about see the color wire that I use for the power switches. So, set that up here. Do that up. lot louder. It's a hell of a lot louder than that Gen 1. Um, I haven't turned down the volume on these Golden Harvest V3 boards yet. Uh, just wanted to show how good, great a job Dennis did on this hill. I haven't got choice off. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> These three hilts are quite beasts, they're quite big beasts. Um, now that I've done a review and I've got photos of all three of them, not overly sure if I want to keep all three of them. Uh, if any, I, I did definitely want to keep the Gen 2, um, that's for sure. It's a beautiful, beautiful hilt. Well done, Dennis. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I, I like Dennis's work. I wasn't a big fan of his. Um, Fallen Order, by any means, um, Ogdo Killer, sorry, but his Crimson Lords absolutely fantastic, really, really cool, really good job. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's put that back down there. All of my chassis are designed to slide down diameters, by the way, guys. If you're finding you have to sound something, there's something not quite right, printing tolerances. Uh, with your how your prints is configured if you're buying STLs um, they should everything should slide down nice and easy okay so gen 2 gen 1 and the core band for LDM Crimson Menace thank you very much for watching guys this is a, a very good interesting one to be able to compare between all three models. Um, I've already told you which one's my favourite. Uh, I believe Cal's still got some of these in stock. I'm not sure about Shane. Uh, anyway, go check them out. Go get one. Uh, well done, Dennis. Great job. Thanks for watching, guys. Hit like, hit subscribe. Um, I'm not really doing. I only do reviews on Sabres I like. I'm not doing reviews on sabers that I've got and that I think are rubbish because I don't want to openly go out and say bad things about anybody. Dennis did a great job on this one, the Gen 2. Absolutely fantastic. Go check him out. Thanks guys. See you later. Bye.